Well, hello and welcome to this presentation, an overview of the Dick and Carey Instructional Design Model. My name is Dr. David Lewis, and in the next few minutes, I hope to give you a brief overview of this model. So let's begin. In this presentation, I hope to present a little bit about the history of the model. I also want to discuss how the Dick and Carey model is related to ADDI, and I'll explain the purpose of the steps within the model. I also hope to describe the inputs, the outputs, and outcomes of each of the steps in the model, and I'll use an example to explain each of those steps as well. Let's begin this presentation of the Dick and Carey model by describing the people involved with the model's origins. So first, let's answer the question, who are Dick and Carey? Walter Dick is an emeritus professor from Florida State University. He worked with Lou Carey to develop the instructional design model. But remember, our textbook is by Dick Carey and Carey, James Carey, Lou Carey's husband, recently joined the team because of his expertise with educational technology and new media. Both of the Careys were recently at the University of South Florida, but have since retired. The systems approach model used in our textbook was first taught in an instructional design course in 1968. The first edition of the Systematic Design of Instruction was later published in 1978. This textbook and the model it described quickly became the standard instructional design model because of its comprehensive nature, the fact that it was performance-based, and that it used a systems approach. While Dick and Carey are credited with the model, in this edition they thank many well-known instructional theorists who were also at FSU at the time. These include Robert Gagné, Leslie Briggs, Robert Glazer, Lee Crumbach, and others. But Dick and Carey are the ones who should be credited with this model. Some have criticized this model as being overly focused on performance problems, but even in this first edition, this model considers concepts and rules as a part of the instructional design process, so these criticisms are probably unwarranted. Our current textbook, the seventh edition, was published nearly 30 years later, but has kept pace with the changes in instructional design and includes prescriptions and suggestions for the three main epistemologies, behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. As they describe it, this book attempts to be epistemologically neutral. Finally, it also considers 21st century technologies and distance learning. Let's turn now to the Dick and Carey model. This model is used to develop instructional materials. The model is process-based and requires a series of steps or processes, and this is what this class will be about. This presentation will be a brief overview of the model, but other presentations will look at specific steps in the model. The Dick and Carey model is based on the scientific perspective. Science takes a reductionist perspective, which in this case emphasizes breaking the instruction down into smaller components. Because it is based upon learning as a science, it requires measurable outcomes. Therefore, it often emphasizes the identification of skills, and it should also be stated that it assumes that there is a relationship between the instructional materials themselves and student performance. Now then, let's consider the Dick and Carey model, but as it relates to this, the Addy model. The Dick and Carey model is not the Addy model, although there are some similarities because they were developed about the same time. ADDI is a generalized instructional design model without specific procedural steps. The ADDI model has five separate phases, analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. Okay, let's consider the ADDI model as these five separate phases. Here you have both models in one slide. So let's compare the two by using some color to help make a point or two. 
For the purposes of this presentation, implementation and evaluation will be combined. This is because implementation is not represented in the Dick and Carry model. But if you think about it, each time you teach something or implement it, you usually evaluate the product and revise it the next time you present it. This purple box represents revision, which is represented in the Dick and Carry model but not mentioned in the Addy model. Now if we were to look at the Dick and Carey model and describe it based upon the Addy model, it would look something like this. So this graphic now has the phases of Addy mapped to the Dick and Carey model. Later I will describe the contents of each of those boxes, but for now let's look at this color-coded Dick and Carey model but from a very general perspective. Notice the three red boxes to the left. Think of this as the analysis phase of the Dick and Carey model. So like Addy, the Dick and Carey model has analysis in the beginning. That is, the first thing we do is conduct an analysis of the instructional problem. Next, from the red boxes, let's look from left to right and notice the blue and green boxes. It is in this part of the model that we design, develop, design, and develop. This shows us that to some extent that design and development are iterative processes. Finally, the instructional design model concludes when you implement and or evaluate those instructional materials. Also notice that in each cycle there is some revision that occurs. In addition, it's very important to note the dotted lines that show that although the model proceeds from left to right, you can return to previous steps by revising what you have done. So just as in the Addy model, we are moving from left to right and from the analysis phase through design and development to implementation and evaluation. Next, let's look at the contents of those little boxes. Here is the whole model with each step labeled, but let's just focus on the red box there. This is the first step in the Dick and Carey model and is a form of analysis. To use Dick and Carey's terminology, it is to assess needs to identify goals. This step is often just called needs assessment or needs analysis of the project. There's a whole lot of literature written about needs assessment, but we'll just discuss it briefly here. The reason we assess the project needs, quite simply, is so we can identify the goals of the project. As we do that, the first question that we should have is, is this really an instructional problem? It is quite possible that the instruction isn't necessary, or that the problem isn't an instructional problem. But if the need is truly an instructional problem, then we can proceed with our needs assessment. Let's say we have been directed to teach people about cars. Okay. In this case, there is an instructional problem here that we can tackle. Given we have an instructional problem, we should then have questions about who we are going to be teaching these people are called learners. Even though there is a later stage specifically aimed at describing the learners and the performance context, we should generally define our would-be learners during the needs assessment. This will help us define the need and write a goal statement. Think of it this way. In order to really fulfill an instructional need, We've got to know who is going to do what and under what conditions. So when we talk about learners, is our audience grandparents or teenagers? Who are these learners? For this presentation, we can briefly and simply describe them as new drivers. Maybe they are teenagers, maybe not. Now we must also make some general assumptions about the instruction and what will be available during the instruction. In other words, what is our instructional context? For instance, is this instruction to be accomplished at home or at school? So under what conditions are the learners expected to perform? 
each of these ideas should be written down and considered and your end product or output for this step in the model is an instructional goal or even a set of instructional goals. We should also be writing a brief description of the learners, the performance context, and any tools that the learners must be using during the instruction. So the goal of this project would be to show new drivers how to use a car. Okay, the second step in the Dick and Carry model is to conduct an instructional analysis. Of all the steps involved in the Dick and Carry model, you may find this one to be the most challenging. Let me be clear here. Learning theorists have described many types of learning and the instruction must be based upon the type of learning involved. Therefore, an instructional analysis can become complicated. Dick and Carey devote two chapters to this step. During instructional analysis, one of the main things that you want to be considering is your goal. This is formally described as goal analysis. You may also want to perform something called a subordinate skills analysis. Now with that said, in each of these boxes, we will have inputs from the previous steps and we'll also have products or outputs in each step. It's a good idea to follow the arrows in this diagram when thinking about inputs and outputs. In step two, the input is the goal from step one. Remember the goal we produced? show new drivers how to use a car. So let's use that goal to describe our instruction and think about goal analysis. To explain this term we really just mean what is it that the learner must learn. Are we teaching them how to perform a task? Are they going to use some new concept? Or is this just about changing learner attitudes? We must think of our goal in terms of the type of learning that is occurring. In this case, we're pondering a series of psychomotor skills. The verb use is a big tip here. It's how to do something. Teaching someone how to use a car is procedural or also described as psychomotor skills. It's skills based. The output of this step is to diagram the goal or produce a graphical depiction of the main steps required to perform the instructional goal. This is where the subordinate skills analysis comes in. And if you think about it, there are many types of things that must be taught when teaching someone how to use a car. How to use turn signals, how to shift gears, etc. But one important subordinate skill is how to start a car. The required steps for starting a car are putting the key in the car, turning the key, and putting your foot on the gas. So our output of this analysis is a stepwise procedural process describing our goal. So the goal analysis in this case becomes a diagram of skills. Okay, the next step in the Dick and Carry model is to analyze learners and context. This is also sometimes referred to as a learner analysis and context analysis. In this step we have our goal from the first step as an input and we also have a brief description of our learners. To conduct a learner analysis, we need to identify the learner's current knowledge and skills, their preferences and attitudes, including dispositions. We will also need to perform a context analysis of the performance setting and describe the learning environment. Our output is a detailed description of the learners, the learning environment, and we should also consider the resources and tools used in this environment. Given our previous example, we should write a detailed description of the learners who will be learning how to use a car. 
We should also describe the driving environment. Are we going to teach them how to drive on wet surfaces, for instance? What about snow? Next, we move into the design phase. This next step of the Dick and Carry model is write performance objectives. Without getting into the details too much, performance objectives are short verbal statements with a specific form. Objectives describe the learner's performance. Notice where we are in the model. The input for this step is all the information we have gathered so far. In the three previous steps, we have collected a lot of information. We must synthesize what we know about the skills to be learned, the characteristics of our audience, the learning and performance context, and now write a series of statements. The output of this step is a series of performance objectives. For our earlier example, a well-written objective would be at the end of this instruction, the learner will be able to start a car given the keys. The next step in the model is to develop assessment instruments. Notice that we're doing so before we actually develop our instructional materials. This may seem somewhat unusual for many people, but the model has always been this way in that we've developed those assessments first. And if you think about it, it makes some sense. If you already have that assessment, be it a test or whatever, you know how to prepare the learner for the test. So given our earlier example, a proper assessment of our instruction would be for a learner to actually start a car. This would be observed by someone and checked off as a completed task. There are many different types of assessments, but typically the learner must perform some action in order to demonstrate proficiency. The input in this case was the performance objective, and the output will be in an assessment. Well, we have finally come to a step that many people would recognize as instructional design. Sadly, many developers or even educators start by developing an instructional strategy. However, they are without all the direction and guidance from the materials we've developed so far. Recall that so far we have several inputs. We have conducted a needs assessment, a goal analysis, we have analyzed the learners and learning context, we've also written performance objectives and developed assessments. With all that study of the instructional problem, it should not be too difficult to develop an efficient, effective instructional strategy. While that may sound easy, we must synthesize all of these materials to consider learning theory and the characteristics of instructional media. Finally, Dick and Carey suggest the output for this step is a formal description of the instruction to be developed. In some cases, instructional designers do not develop the instruction, but are only the architects of that instruction. So they must develop a design document in order to communicate to the developers what the instruction must be. For instance, this document may be a script or a detailed storyboard or both. To develop these documents, the instructional designer must organize the content by structuring lessons. To do so, they must plan the presentation of materials by structuring the content into what Dick and Carey calls the learning components. These are a series of activities that promote learning. More about that later. Finally, the instructional designer must at some point decide upon a delivery system, be it video or web or classroom delivery. In the example we described earlier, to teach someone how to drive, the delivery system could include one of many types of instructional media although a simulator would be nice to help develop driving skills. Certainly, to assess learners, though, an instructor should probably observe the learner as they drive an actual car. In this step of the model, we actually develop the instruction. The input for this stage is the instructional design document mentioned earlier. These strategies and documents are used to produce the instruction prescribed. 
the output for this step is all the appropriate instructional material such as instructors manuals or student handouts in the case of e-learning it would be web pages or computer based materials such as PowerPoint or video files in this step of the Dick and Carey instructional design model instructional designers must evaluate what they have produced this step is concerned with a formative evaluation and that may be conducted at any point during the design or development of instruction that's as opposed to a summative evaluation which happens after the instruction has been developed a formative evaluation may be conducted on just one component of the instruction think of it as a beta test or a field trial it's just to be used at, to test those instructional materials to evaluate them and see if they actually work this may occur one-on-one -on -one with a learner or with small groups the output for this step is the data on the feasibility of those materials given learners resources and settings let's use the driving example we used earlier now let's say there is a prototype driving simulation that has been developed and we're going to test that simulation this would provide data to designers and developers for improving the product and that's the purpose of a formative evaluation this data would be your output the revision step may occur at any point during the design or development of the instruction inputs can come from a number of different points within the model let's take the case that the input has come from our driving simulation or a formative evaluation for instance in this case we have received data from our simulation developers which tells us about our learners and that they're not doing so well at certain areas in the simulation this data for instance could show us that the learners need some additional instruction given parallel parking because they're failing that portion of the simulation designers could then take that input from the developers and redesign the instructional materials to include a new section devoted specifically to parallel parking techniques the final step of the Dick and Carey model actually lies outside of the instructional design process this is because by the time we actually do a summative evaluation we've already designed and developed instructional materials this evaluation by its definition alone occurs after the fact it may be an in-depth study by independent third party to provide the designers with valuable feedback sometimes it's difficult to see the imperfections of your product especially if you've been working with it for a long time outside parties or subject matter experts can provide suggestions where your instruction is lacking there are many types of analysis that can be conducted on your materials or program the most important ways of conducting a summative evaluation is to determine its impact on learner performance performance data is very useful for determining deficiencies the output for this step is any evidence that the instructional materials do not meet the needs outlined in the needs assessment in step one well I hope you've enjoyed this presentation it was a bit complicated and remember this model is described in a 300 page book and it is better described in that book this presentation was only provided as an overview of the Dick and Carey model please consult other resources for an in-depth analysis of the model thank you for your time goodbye